اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والحمد للہ اللذی جعلنا من المتمسکین بولایت امیر المؤمنین ولعمت المعصومین علیہم السلام والحمد للہ اللذی هدانا لہذا وما کنا لنہتدی لولا ان هدانا اللہ ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنت الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين عما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا قوامين بالقسط شهداء لله ولو على أنفسكم آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم ما صل على محمد وآل محمد أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala There is no doubt that it's due to his kindness and generosity that he gives us opportunities such as these where we gather in remembrance and in glorification of him tabaraka wa ta'ala then we send our condolences and to our living imam imam al hujja ajjal allah ta'ala farajahu sharif allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad and to each and every one of you as we gather this evening to commemorate the istishhad anniversary of the commander of the faithful Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhima afdalu salatu wa salam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad We have been discussing for the past two days about the reforms and the changes that Imam alayhi salam instituted into the government that he took over after 25 years when the rights and the Khilafah were usurped from him and when they were given back to him at the behest of the congregation and the Muslim Ummah the Imam salam to bring back to the way the Prophet used to govern and the way the Prophet used to um, establish the laws of Sharia and the dictates of Sharia the Imam salam had to bring reforms he had to bring changes and we have discussed two reforms already we discussed the reform of Idariya, the administrative reforms that the Imam brought. And the second yesterday we discussed the Siyasatu Thiqafiyya, the cultural reforms that the Imam alayhi salam brought. Now very quickly, you know what we have to try and understand is that when the Imam alayhi salam is trying to bring a reform or wants a reform, a reform does not mean that you are being taken out of the center. Rather reform means you are being um, bring brought back to the center. It is because you had gone or transgressed to either extremes. Reform means that you are being brought back to the path that was originally intended. And this is what is known as the path of i'tidal, the path of balance or the path of um, equilibrium, really. Um, in the ilm of akhlaq, this is also known as the path of i'tidal. You know, they say that a believer must remain in the state of i'tidal and they should not go in ifrat or tafrit. They should not go into the two extremes, rather they should be balanced. So for an example, it would be that we are recommended to be courageous, right? But even courageous, there has two limits or two opposing sides. One can be um, a coward, 
Yeah, where when it's time for them to be courageous, they'll duck under the table and hide. While other people, they take courageous to a new limit where they are foolhardy. They are always rushing into things and not thinking things through. And that is the other extreme of being courageous. So that is the ifrat and the tafrit. What is expected is to be balanced. And that is to be courageous at the right times and the right measure. When you look at what the Imam alayhi salam is reforming, he is bringing the ummah back into a state of equilibrium. Yeah? The ummah had transgressed, the ummah had fallen on two sides. There were those who were extreme on one end and then there were those who were extreme on another. And the Imam salam was trying to teach us the path of equilibrium, the path of balance. And when we look at these reforms that we talked about, it is all reforms that are not self-serving Rather, they are serving the needs of the ummah as a whole. Yeah? This is if you reflect upon what we have talked about, right? That in Islam, the success of, uh, of one's action is not in response or in equivalence to how my action benefits me. Rather, how my action benefits the ummah at large. Yeah? And if my action is such where only I benefit and the ummah suffers, that action in itself has no value. Yeah? That action in itself is actually counterproductive. And so you see the reforms that the Imam salam was instituting from the administrative side and, and the balance in justice that he was giving to everyone. That served the ummah's interest. It did not serve individuals' interests. Rather, one can say that that form of justice is actually counterintuitive to individual interests, right? Where individually one cannot get a leg up because the Imam practiced such justice. Yesterday we talked about the intellectual or the thiqafi and you see how the intellectual um, standards that were being preached by the Imam salam were those that the entire ummah can benefit from by going out and studying in education and these type of things. Today we're focusing on a third reform. And this third reform is what is known as as siyasatul iqtisadiya Economic reforms of the Imam alayhi salam. Yeah? Where now you have dealt with the justice aspect. Um, you have brought back what God's haqs are, hukuk are. Then you've talked about the intelli- intellectual aspects. Now you talk about the economic aspect. One cannot deny that the economic um, upbringing of a community is vital for the well-being of that community, right? And in Islam, there has been a great emphasis that has been placed um, in earning a livelihood. Yeah? We're going out and working hard and not relying on other people to make you successful. Yeah? Not relying on other people to give you something so that you don't have to work as hard. In Islam, there has been an emphasis to go out and work hard. And you look at the reforms or the changes that the Imam salam was instituting. This was one of the fundamental ones where he encouraged everyone to go and participate in the sphere of economy. Yeah? Where one cannot be a burden on the rest of the ummah when it comes to working or in livelihood and how they attain the livelihood. Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Umma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. When in his promotion of going out and working, he would, there's a very beautiful statement that he makes. He says, Inni La ubghizu ar rajul yakunu kaslanan min amri dunya. He says that I hate, I despise for a man to be lazy in his worldly affairs. Yeah. Li annahu idha kana kaslana min amri dunyahu fahuwa an amri akhirihi aksal. Yeah. He says, for if he is lazy in his worldly affairs, I guarantee that man is lazier in his ukhrawi affairs. Yeah. In his hereafter affairs. Yeah? If we're not willing to provide for our family, if we're not willing to work hard and try to earn a better life for our family, the Imam salam says, you are no way concentrating about your akhirah and trying to provide a better akhirah for yourself. If you are lazy in dunya, you're going to be even lazier about your akhirah. It's a fact. Yeah? It's a fact. When people are lazy about even providing the bare minimum, for their family, they're not going to be concerned about that which is after their death, right? So the Imam was trying to tell the people, look, you need to 
work hard. You need to go out and do something. You need to go out and earn a livelihood. Because if we remain in a state of laziness, the, the cycle of poverty will just continue. Right? Uh, again, we come to another tradition that he states. Uh, he says, Inna al ashya lamma izdawajat azdawajal kaslu wal ajzu. He says, when things were combined, this is very interesting, he's probably talking in a metaphysical way, but he says, when things were joined together and combined or chosen as pairs, laziness and incapability were joined together. Yeah? That means laziness and not producing anything were joined together, and the outcome for nutija baynahuma al fakr. Yeah? And the outcome of these two joining together was continued poverty. Yeah? That when one does not go out and work hard, yeah, they can't expect a change yeah, in their financial outcome. Right? They can't be surprised that how come I never got rich? Well, Baba, you didn't do anything. Yeah? You didn't work hard. Now at that time, what the Imam salam was trying to say to the people is that look, get out of the habit of relying on Baytul Mal for your livelihood. Where once a week you would go, you know, they said that different khalifas gave out different ways. Certain khalifas gave it out once a year. So you would get this entire man and now you have to look after it. The Imam alayhi salam changed that policy. He said he would give it out every Friday. Anything collected, he would give it out to the people. But the Imam alayhi salam was trying to say that get out of the habit of relying on this wealth when you have the ability to work and earn your own livelihood, right? In, in today's day and age, it's, it's the same equivalent of a human being who has the ability to work but chooses to collect unemployment for no reason. Yeah? He has the ability to work but gets a doctor's note to write that he is or she is, has certain problems and can't work. And now they're getting money. That money that we are getting in itself is putting a burden on society. Yeah? When that could have been one less person that has to be the society has to pay for. We are not exempt from these rules because we claim to be living in a kafir country. Yeah? We are not. Which doesn't mean that we can take advantage of these systems. Now naturally, if you are retired, you, you've earned it. Right? If you are genuinely sick, you have earned it. But if you have the ability, Islam promotes going and working. Yeah, earning a livelihood. And furthermore, not only did Imam salam encourage this so that people would not rely on Baytul Mal, at the same time, he encouraged this so that people would not beg. Yeah? Begging. You know, begging is one of the most despised things in Islam. Right? It goes really two ways, you know, that we're told never beg unless, like, you know, unless your situation is such where you're absolutely forced to. But even then, if you get to that breaking point, still try not to beg. Right? God will provide for you. Yeah? God wants to see. He wants to push your limits. But at the same time, we're told if someone comes begging to you, don't turn them away. You know what I mean? So on one hand, don't beg. But if someone comes begging to you, don't turn them away. Because they've already lowered themselves to you, don't humiliate them by turning them even away, right? We, we sometimes, I don't know, I'm disappointed in the way we act sometimes. We humiliate people, you know, we humiliate people when they beg, you know, when someone comes to you with their needs, we'll listen to it and we'll say, oh, what happened? How did it happen? Oh, I can't believe this happened. No, I can't help you. Yeah? Baba, why did you make that person embarrass himself in front of you? Yeah? If you were not going to give from the very beginning, don't ask for details, right? We'll take the details, we'll do all of these things, and then we'll turn them away, right? Um, this is one of the worst things that we can do. But the Imam salam here is trying to teach us, right? That go out and do something so that you are not a burden on society and so that you are not begging. Sadly, you know, sadly. Of course, in other countries there are beggars, but... You know, in, in Muslim countries, if most of us have visited Muslim countries and, and have, have lived in maybe Muslim countries, it's embarrassing the level of begging that is taking place because you know 90% of that begging is a lie. Yeah, you know it, right? We lived in Sham. It, it was terrible that the 90% ruined it for the other 10% who were real. 
you know. But you would see that a van load of people would come get dropped off, yeah, and then they would beg, and then they would hop on the van at the end of the day and they would go home. It happened at JCC while we were there in the first 15 days. A man would drive, drop three ladies off, and they would beg, and then he would come and collect them in his car at the end of the day. We see that at Juma here. It's sad yeah, that our Muslims have not learned the ethics of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. Yeah? And that when one who does not value the Ahlul Bayt and does not prescribe to the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt will resort to actions which are contradictory to the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. Right? And it's, it's, a, it's frustrating that our Ummah has gotten to that. But so the Imam alayhi salam was, was teaching us the importance of, of going out there and, and having a trade. You know, at the end of the day, the Imam, by him saying that go out and don't beg, it didn't matter what kind of job you got. Just work. Work for a livelihood, right? Don't ever think that this job is beneath me. Sometimes, you know, we have that mentality as well, right? That no, no, I can't do this. Yeah? I can't do this work. And so because I can't do this work, um, I'm going to put myself a burden on other people, right? Either a burden on my own family to support me, or a burden on my community to support me, or a burden on the state to support me, because I am not willing to go out there. And so the Imam alayhi salam, this was a very important reform for him. A very important change that he wanted to bring in the mindset of the people that they should not resort to these methods of living or earning a livelihood. And one of the things that he further did on top of this was that he highly encouraged um, the development of a profession, right? Where one becomes a professional in something, um, or one picks up a trade, or one gets into business for themselves. These things are highly. Um, encouraged in Islam where either you become a professional um, where you pick up a trade that is um, that requires effort that requires time but at the same time you have reached a place where now you have become an expert in something or you pick up a trade a trade which is needed in society like for example um, I don't know, like building something, like a builder. yeah. Or maybe in that time you're building pots out of clay, so that's your profession. But you, it's not like anybody can just go and build a clay pot. Yeah? You have to become a professional or an expert at that. Or furthermore, to, to engage in trade, where you become a businessman. Right? And you look at these three things, and it's remarkable why Islam emphasizes these three things more than others. It's because when you go after these three things, you become independent. Yeah? You become independent and you don't rely on other people. Right? There's nothing wrong in working a 9 to 5 job. Yeah, it's a halal livelihood. Yeah? In fact, it is considered ibadat as we will talk in a minute. But if you can avoid it and work for yourself, or bring a trade where people need you rather than you needing them, yeah? You become needless. You see, that's what Islam tries to get human beings towards. Otherwise, if you are working for an employer, right, um, you're always going to be in some way or another in a subjugated position. Right? Where if I need time off, I have to go and subjugate myself and ask for a time off. When I want time off for Eid, I have to go and beg for time off for Eid. When I want a raise, I have to go and beg for a raise. All of these things bring about subjugation. Islam promotes independence. right? Islam promotes needlessness of other human beings. Now, granted, this is not possible for every human being. Islam understands that. Imam understood that. But he still was emphasizing something of a higher standard, but then still encouraged any type of employment, right? So, for example, we'll, we'll quote a couple of hadiths which he talked about. Um, one of these, he says, تَعَرَّضُوا tijara, Engage in tijara, engage in business, right? Engage in trade. فَإِنَّ فِيهَا غِنَا لَكُمْ عَمَّا فِي أَيْدٍ nas. Because in that trade is self-sufficiency, right? 
where you become independent from what other people talked about. Furthermore, for what other people have in their hands. Furthermore, when you go out and work, no matter what you do, right? Um, again, we're not saying don't have a 9 to 5 business job where you have to clock in and clock out. No, that is in itself uh, highly, highly noble. But Islam set a standard yeah, where he, they don't want subjugation of any believer to anybody else. At the same time, the Imam encouraged working, working any job. Um, where he says in a tradition to, this is a very beautiful tradition that he said to freed slaves. Yeah? Slaves who had become free, now what would they do? Right? Um, what background would they have? What training would they have? So the Imam alayhi salam says, um, Ittajiru, Barakallah, he says them. He says to them, engage in trade. Yeah? Do something. Start a business. Um, become... Um, be, become a part of the working society, right? Just because you suffered a hardship and now you're not suffering a hardship doesn't mean that you are exempted from working. Very brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, if you think about it. Sometimes we, we say, woe to me. No, let me just get this check. Yeah? Um, no, I was done unjustly at my work. I'm going to claim unemployment so my employer feels it, right? Or something like that. We think we're getting back to somebody. The Imam is telling these freed slaves, look, yeah, um, God will give you your rights back. You engage yeah, in trade. You engage in some type of business because I've heard the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family say, in rizqa asharatu ajsa tis'atu fil tijara wa wahid fi ghayriha. Yeah? Beautiful. He says, because I've heard the Prophet say that rizq, provision, is broken up into ten parts. And nine parts are for those who are working and earn a halal livelihood, while one part is garnered through other ways or other means. Yeah? Did you guys understand that? Yeah? That means when you go out to work, my brothers and sisters, yeah, you are fulfilling nine tenths of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nine tenths. Right? The salah and the siyam and all of these other things are one tenth. We, we take one tenth and make it nine tenths, right? Thinking that that's what counts. No, what counts is you going out there. You, you putting in, you sweating for the sake of your family and your life, right? And this is why, you know, people, I, I think I've given this example. People say to me, like, oh, um, or I know I've heard they said, I've, it's been said to me. Um, and I've heard it said to other ulama as well that, mashallah, you guys um, live the life because you get to practice deen all day. Yeah? And I'm like, no, are you kidding me? Yeah? I'm fulfilling one-tenth, I've got to worry about nine-tenths. Yeah? You guys are fulfilling nine-tenths, mashallah. Yeah? Those of you who will stay up here until 12 and have to wake up at 6 to go to work. And then we get in this discussion, I've gotten into this discussion with so many people uh, who genuinely feel bad that look, I don't have time to focus on ibadat. Yeah? Because how could you? Right? Really, how could you? I mean, without burning yourself out entirely, you get home from mosque at about 11, 11.30. The little that you can do, you spend time with your family. You go to sleep, you wake up, you go to work. There's not much time to do anything else. I feel the reward for that is far greater than if I were to sit and recite Quran the entire night in the month of Ramadan. Yeah? what you guys do, right? So don't be down that you don't feel like you're accomplishing much, right? Imam saying, go out, work, earn a livelihood, for that fulfills the majority of your um, ibadat and your worship and your duties to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Ma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So when we look at some of these reforms, Right? That the Imam alayhi salam instituted. Um, what can we take as a lesson in our own lives? Right? Um, because again, for those who, are, who have, haven't been here for the first two, the, the focus of these discussions is to prepare ourselves for a government, um, the, time, the kind of government that Imam Ali alayhi salam had, because that's the same government that the twelfth Imam will have. Right? And if we're not able to focus and understand the type of government that the first Imam had, 
uh, we're going to have a lot of difficulty accepting the government that the 12th Imam brings as well, right? So here the Imam salam focused on education, I mean on employment. So what are the, some of the things we have to do? We have to um, encourage people to work. We do, right? We have to encourage people to work. You know, it starts from a young age. I don't, I, I'm not sure, I'm sure many of us do this, but when I was young, as soon as I hit 16 or 17, um, my mom said, you got to go and work, young man. Yeah? And I was sent out to work. Yeah? I was sent out to work. I, was, I had to go and bring something home. I couldn't just live there. I was still in high school, but I had to go and work. Yeah? I wasn't um, pampered and provided. No, there was an obligation for me. And I think working from that age of 16 and 17 um, brought a different perspective into me. The importance of, of, of that hard-earned dollar not to see it go wasted. You know, you, when I'm young, when I was young, I remember uh, my dad would work long hours and we had just migrated. And obviously he didn't have much. He was trying to work wherever he could. And I couldn't understand that why I couldn't get certain things that my friends had, you know. But obviously there was great value to that money that he had. I didn't, I didn't get it. Right? I didn't get it. Um, until I started earning my own money. Yeah? And then when somebody wanted it, I'd be like, hey, hey, hold up. Yeah? You can't have my money. Yeah? Because I worked hard for this money. And it makes sense, right? But, but if a child doesn't learn that, yeah? a child's not never going to grow up. Right? They're, they're going to be economically and financially immature for a very long time. Right? So, so we have to encourage that type of work. So other things that we can do is we can help in creating um, uh, avenues for people to find jobs. Right? We had talked about this many years ago. We had even started something here and it never really... Um, I, I, we gave it off to other people and maybe the database is coming in. But we had, we had put together or started the process of putting together a database of employers within our community, um, of people who had certain qualifications within our community. Because every day or every other day or every third day, I get someone coming to me and I'm sure someone comes to you and says, I need help finding a job. Right? And what can I do? What can you do? But if we as a community have a database of, of, of employment or employers, we can utilize that, right? And we can make sure that we um, promote this economic lifestyle and upliftment within the community. Imagine if we start doing that, we are really strengthening our ummah, isn't it? Yeah, where we are helping each other find good paying jobs. We're helping each other become successful um, in different things. For some reason, you know, we, we shy away like, you know, part of what the economic upliftment does is that um, it's obviously we've talked about it becoming, making us independent and needless of others. But part of economic upliftment, what it does is it cultivates and creates prosperity within the community. Right? Are you guys with me? Yes? yes? Yeah. It creates prosperity and cultivates prosperity within the community where why should I give my money outside the community and why not use it within the community so that money recycles within the community? You know what I'm saying? You look at um, the Jewish community. They've done this successfully. Successfully. Yeah? I know we, we, people don't like talking about the Jews, but they, they're a success story here. Yeah? Where they came as minorities at one time and they became successful, we can take lessons from them. Yeah? Um, you look at Jewish areas, there are going to be grocery stores, there are going to be whatever they have, but they're Jewish run and that's where they go and shop. You look at the Sikhs in our areas, right? You just go on airport and dairy, where that big gudwara is, and then you go in the back of that gudwara. I don't know if you've been there. Um, they have everything from car mechanics to grocery stores to furniture stores and everything. Um, Sikh run, and that's where everybody will take their cars and their groceries and, and go buy their furniture and whatever it is. And that money continues to recycle within and they just keep getting richer and richer. For some reason we don't like to do that. Yeah? I don't know what it is, right? Where we say I don't want him to know my business. Yeah? I don't want him to know what kind of groceries I'm buying. Yeah? Yeah? He'll ask too many questions. And sometimes we do it wrong too. 
I remember there was a halal restaurant owned by um, one of our brothers. And uh, some brother brother was telling me, he's like, you know, I, I wanted to support the business. I went there two times, three times. And the third time I went there, he's like, what, your wife's not cooking? So he's like, why would I go back there, right? Like, I mean, you, you got to be smart a little bit, right? I mean, if you're a businessman and somebody's coming to give you business, you don't act in that, in that way where now, I'm not going to give you my business after that comment, isn't it? Um, so it has to work both ways, right? It has to work both ways. But my point here is, is that we need to help cultivate this. The Imam... Um, alayhi salam focused on this. You know, there's a very lovely tradition of the Imam alayhi salam where he wrote this letter to one of the people he had appointed in a particular city by the, by the name of Qardata bin Ka'bil Ansari. Um, he says to him, now then, like Amma Ba'd, some people from among the protected people, the Ahlul Zimma, so these were not Muslims, right? These were people who of different religions, whatever religions they were, it could have been Christianity or Judaism or anybody who accepted the terms of the Islamic State or the government, right? And they were now considered Ahlul Zimma, the protected people, right? That means you could not oppress them, you could not take their rights. They were um, on par basically because of their acceptance of whatever the terms were. He says to them, some of the people from the protected people in your area have reported that a river in their land has been destroyed and submerged. It was a river that they utilized and it has been destroyed and submerged. The Imam says they have the rights over the Muslims. They have, the, they have rights over the Muslims, these people, to engender prosperity for them. Yani we're not allowed to make anyone within our ummah poor and help other people in that cause at the same time. Yeah? So if I have to take something from you to better me, it's not allowed. Right? Rather, if I can work a way where we both benefit, then that's what Islam suggests. But I can never allow or do something where I take someone's right just so I can get an upper right. Same applies for those who are not even Muslim, the Imam says. And he continues, he says, فَلَعَمْرِ لِأَنْ يَعْمُرُوا أَحَبُّ إِلَيْنَا مِنْ أَنْ يَحْرُجُوا وَأَنْ يَعْجَزُوا أَوْ يُقَسِّرُوا فِي وَاجِبٍ مِنْ سَلَاحِ الْبِلَادِ He says, see into this matter that you fix this river. By my life, he says, bringing them prosperity. Yeah, look at what the Imam says. Yeah? Bringing them Prosperity is more pleasant for us than their leaving or getting poor or failing to engender prosperity for them. Yeah? It is more dear to me that they get wealthy from the Muslim Ummah right? than them falling to subjugation or poverty. He's not even talking about Muslims here. Imagine then about Muslims, where how can I live? Right? How can I live knowing that there are my Muslim brothers and sisters? Um, who are suffering, yeah? who can't get a job, who can't afford groceries, who can't afford something, whatever, whatever, right? Whatever I do as a Muslim and as one who follows the teachings of the Imam, it requires that my money circulates back into society so that my society's standards of living improve, right? It starts locally and then it goes wide, nationwide, and then universally. This is why even when you look at our Zakatul Fitra that we give, and any of these different charities that we have, the Zakatul Fitra, the wajib, is that it must go to needy Shias in your own locality. First and foremost, right? We just send it abroad, but there has to be whoever we're giving it to. So for example, if we're giving it to the mosque here, the mosque has to do the due diligence to make sure that there are no needy fuqara Shias in GTA who need that money before they can send it abroad. Yeah? It is wajib. Why? Because the economic upliftment of your community takes priority. It takes priority, right? Now obviously there is an exemption to that rule and that is if you're sending it to your marja. If you're sending it directly to your marja, then you can send it. But otherwise, I can't send it to another institution unless I make sure that the locals are looked after. So here the Imam is, is teaching us the importance of economic reform. And I think 
it's not as it's not as um, it's not as, as, as bling bling, I'm, I'm looking, <laughs> I can't find the word. Um, it's not as um, beautiful as some of the other reforms that he brought, but I think this is probably the most essential one of them, right? Where economically, I, I, I look to make sure that all of my brothers and sisters um, are uplifted based on my economy. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Ali Muhammad. One of the last thing I want to end with is that, okay, so I want to again recap what we've um, covered so far. So the first thing, Imam alayhi salam encouraged um, people to go and work. Yeah? It didn't matter what you do for a living, go and work, right? Um, second thing is the Imam alayhi salam encouraged working so that no one would be um, relying on someone else's wealth for a living nor would they be begging for a living, right? Um, this is a very important point. Third, the Imam salam emphasized economy, uh, seeking a job so that it would uplift the entire community at the same time. So the Ummah would get uplifted. Now all of that is necessary, but all of that requires certain code of conduct, right? And the Imam salam through this entire process when he would tell people go and work he would nest, he would guarantee that or he would try and make sure that those who are going out to work govern themselves with, within the islamic parameters and islamic ethics yeah so i don't go out and i work by by doing unethical things right i don't go out and i work um, by doing something haram, and then I say, well, I'm giving back to my ummah, what's the big deal? Right? Well, that's not the kind of Muslims of the ummah the imam wanted. Right? Um, that's, not, that's not how we recycle or make our wealth pure, by doing those type of things. Right? So there were certain ethical standards that the imam salam, um, wanted. It was very interesting. Right? So on one hand, the imam says, go into business. Right, um, and then if you read letter number thirty-one of Najil Balagha, the Imam says, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, "I feel sorry for those who are in business." Yeah, um, and the reason why he says because when you are in business, it's very, very difficult um, to always do what is right. Very, very difficult. Yeah, where a small corner that you think, okay, just this corner I'll cut, and you cut that corner. Um, it messes up everything. Eh? Literally, I mean, that's the, that's the simplistic way of me saying it messes up everything. Um, so if you can maintain right, um, the, um, the ethics of it, uh, then of course there's nothing like being independent. But there's a very beautiful example that we'll end with. Of, uh, it comes from a tradition from uh, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says that his father used to ride into the, the aswak, the marketplaces every day um, on the mule of the, of the Prophet, on the ride of the Prophet. Um, and he would enter first the butcher's market and he would say, O oh, group of butchers, do not cut off the spinal cord of the animals, nor make haste in taking its life. Let the soul gently leave its body and do not blow into the meat when selling it. So he would give them advice, mawidha, constantly adm uh, admonishing them that hey, this is the way you behave and this is the standards that you should have. Then the imam said he would go, his father would go to the date sellers and he would say to them, display the bad products just like you display the good products. Yeah? And he don't hide the bad products um, right underneath the good products. Display them. Let the people have a choice. You know, literally... Um, there are, and, and obviously sell them at a lower price because there are some people who genuinely can't afford to buy the good product, have a two-tier product system where there are these things happening. Um, these were something that, this is so difficult for a businessman to do. Yeah, so difficult for a business person to do, right? Um, to, to present the bad product alongside the good product, right? Is rather than hiding the bad product. We would always see this in Sham when we would go buy fruits 
and groceries and things like that, you know, first of all, they don't let you pick the fruit. Yeah? So they have all of these beautiful apples in the front. And then when it's time to take from the bag, they take it from the back. Yeah? And when you get home, you see nothing but rotten apples and rotten pears and things like that. You know? um, Subhanallah, the Imam used to scold the people. Yeah? He used to go into the marketplace and say to them that do not cheat the people. Yeah? Do not lie to the people. You must live with certain standards. The Imam went to the fish sellers, his son says, and he would say to them, do not sell except the good, do not sell except the good fish and beware of selling what is caught dead or floating. Then the Imam salam, would go to the Kunasa quarter where various transactions were going on by copper dealers and liquid sellers and sellers of swaddling clothes and needles as well as exchangers and sellers of camphor and cloth. And the Imam would call out and he would say to them, Anna aswaka kum hadihi yahduruhal ayman, fashubu aymanakum bis sadaka, wa kuffu anil halki, anil halfi, fa inna allaha azza wa jal la yukaddisu man halafa bismihi kadiba. He says that these, the selling of what you're doing requires swearing and oaths. Yeah? Wallahi, brother. Yeah? Wallahi. Yeah? He says, what the marketplace that you are in requires swelling, sell, uh, sorry, swearing oaths. Um, mix, he says, mix your oaths with arms and avoid swearing oaths as Allah Almighty will not purify the person who tells lies by swearing to him. Yeah? These were the, the, the advice that the Imam gave. And this is the advice then that we have to take. Right? That in whatever we do in our business world, whether I am working a 9 to 5 job or whether I am my own business person or whatever it is, the honesty and ethics has to be there. Yeah? Has to be there. I can't clock in, go take a break for 45 minutes and tell my boss I've been working the entire time. Yeah? These are unethical. Right? And the Imam salam does not stand for that. And this is where we have to take this admonish, ad, ad, admonishing from the Imam. Um, the fact is, you know, um, the Imam asked people to govern themselves and their base desires. And it's because of this, the people could not like the Imam. Yeah? The Imam became the most polarizing uh, figure where there were those who either uh, loved the Imam or there were those who despised the Imam salam. Yeah? And today, you know, we are gathering, remembering those who, this is the remembrance of those who loved the Imam and the abuse that was placed upon him by those who despised the Imam. It is this night when the Imam salam was in his home. Yeah? The people of Kufa had come, they had given their salams and their farewells to the Imam. The Imam had given the nasiha to the people, the advice to the people. Muhammad bin Hanafiya says that on this night, the entire color of the body of the Imam had changed because of the poison. The Imam's face and his hands and his legs had turned yellow because of the poison. But yet the Imam alayhi salam continued to give advice to his children. The Imam continued to guide the Ummah because that was his role. He was the father of the Ummah. Today my brothers and sisters we are gathering because we are about to become orphaned because our father is leaving this world tonight. Ah, the Imam alayhi salam calls his children forward on this 21st night. He says to his children, Ya, oh O my children, Oh my beloved, I had told you three nights ago that I had seen your grandfather Rasulullah in my dream. And on that day the Prophet said, Yo Ali, you will be coming to me in three days. He says, my children, three days have passed and soon I am about to leave this world. I am about to go and meet your grandfather. He says, he calls Imam Al-Hassan next to him. He says, Ya Aba Muhammad, Usika wa ya aba abdillahi khaira.
فَأَنْتُمَا مِنِّي وَأَنَا مِنْكُمَا He says, O oh, Hassan and Hussein, I wish you the best after this. For you are from me and by God I am from you. ثُمَّ إِلْتَفَتَ إِلَىٰ أَوْلَادِهِ الَّذِينَ مِنْ غَيْرِ فَاطِمَ عَلَيْهَ السَّلَامِ And then he turned his attention to his children who were not from Fatima alayhi salam. وَأَوْسَاهُمْ أَنْ لَا يَخَالِفُوا أَوْلَادَ فَاطِمَ He says, do not disrespect the children of Fatima. Do not turn your backs from the children of Fatima. Follow the children of Fatima for they will take you to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he began to say to Imam al-Hassan that after I die apply the same hunut that was applied when we buried your grandfather Rasulullah apply the same potions upon me and wash my body in that similar way and then he continued to advise he would say fear Allah fear Allah when it comes to the Quran do not let anyone excel you in the recitation and knowledge of Quran he says fear Allah with salah as salah as salah he would say because it is umududdin he says fear the or fear Allah when it comes to the orphan because they are the trust of those who are the leaders and then the Imam alayhi salam one by one took the hands of his children he took the hands of Hussein and placed it on the hands of Hassan and said oh Hussein after me Hassan your brother will be the Imam and it will be him you have to follow he took the hands of all of his children one by one and placed it on the hands of Hassan he said he is the Shia he is the Imam of the Shia after me at this time Khutbah mentioned a very touching story Khutaba mentioned that at this time Imam saw Ummul Banin crying from the side Imam says to her Ya Ummul Banin what makes you cry at this time Ummul Banin said Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, you know I do not question your judgment you know that I do not question your knowledge she says tell me what is your concern he said you took the hands of everybody and you placed it on the hands of Hassan but you did not take the hands of Abbas and place it on the hands of Hassan wow Imam alayhi salam calls Imam calls Abu al-Fazl al-Abbas he places the hands of Abbas on the hands of Hussein and says Abbas look after my son Hussein Abbas guard Hussein with your life ah Mu'mineen after this Khutaba and our hadith tell us that the Imam alayhi salam sweat beads began to appear on his forehead Zainab alayhi salam came by her father she began to wipe the sweat from his face Imam alayhi salam says oh Zainab I have heard your grandfather Rasulullah say that when a believer is in his final moments of his life sweat beads will appear on their forehead and there is time for for them to know that they will be leaving at this time it is that the Imam alayhi salam closed his eyes and became quiet he became quiet all of a sudden he opened his eyes he gathered his children he said Hada Rasulullah <laughs> وَهَذَا أَخِي جَعْفَارِ He says, I see Rasulullah in front of me. I see Hamza in front of me. I see my brother Jafar in front of me. And they are calling me towards them and saying that they are longing to see me. The Imam faces towards the Qibla. The Imam straightens his hands and his legs. The Imam continues to recite, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا Cry, Mu'mineen. We are being orphaned tonight. Cry, Mu'mineen. If you cannot cry, don't look at me. Look down. We are being orphaned tonight. The Imam said, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-aliyyil azim. And then Imam took a shallow breath and the soul of the Imam departed his body. 
رحم الله من نادى وا اماما وا مظلوما وا سيدا ماتم حسين